Welcome to this second lecture on uh, Karl Marx's philosophy, politics, and economics. In lecture one, we discussed uh, Marx's relationship with the young Hegelians and uh, his associated critique of religion, his eventual falling out with the young Hegelians, and his gradual conversion to historical materialism. In this session, we will look more closely at Marx's account of human flourishing in his early writings and some of its connections with materialism. Between uh, 1843 and 1845, Marx went to live with his friend Arnold Ruge in Paris. Their plan was to publish a new journal, the German-French Annual, with the collaboration of other uh, prominent radicals, other than Marx and Ruge, uh, Moses Hess and uh, Michael Bakunin, the Russian anarchist. Uh, and Marx published his famous essay on the Jewish question there, along with his introduction to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. Marx also met Engels uh, in Paris during this time, and you know, you can sort of imagine uh, these two uh, longtime friends and collaborators hanging out in the cafes around the Palais Royal in uh, central Paris in the mid 1840s and talking philosophy, Hegel, and politics. Um, in 1844, Marx began his lifelong study of political economy, and in the process he produced what later came to be known uh, as the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844. In 1845, the French government shut down the German-French annual and expelled Marx from the country, uh, which was the beginning of a series of moves for, uh, for Marx and the Marx family. Today we will study these manuscripts closely. They contain a rough uh, philosophical materialism, which issued from Marx's critique of religion, and a philosophical anthropology, that is uh, Marx's own theory of human nature. Marx was a philosophical materialist. To be distinguished from historical materialism, Marx's theory of history. Uh, so Marx was a philosophical materialist in the sense that he took the external world to be independent of the existence of human beings or consciousness or God. Um, and I think far more important in these writings and far more influential is Marx's philosophical materialism, philosophical anthropology, um, which is much better developed theoretically, and it, which is his theory of human nature. Um, and Marx here follows Hegel in thinking that human freedom and self-realization requires that the subject somehow be able to see herself in her own object. But what exactly this means and how it is to be spelled out uh, is, of course, something we need, we'll need to figure out. So here's a first cut attempt to begin premise by premise to think through what this philosophical anthropology looks like. So in the third manuscript from the map from the, the Paris manuscripts on private property and labor, Marx writes, um, hunger is a natural need. It therefore requires a nature and an object outside itself in order to satisfy and still itself. Hunger is the acknowledged need of my body for an object which exists outside itself and which is indispensable to its integration and to the expression of its essential nature. The sun is the object of the plant, an indispensable object which, con which confirms its life, just as the plant is an object for the sun, as expression um, of its life awakening power and its objective essential power. So Marx thinks that what is true of the sun is true of 
the human. Um, just as the sun must externalize its powers on the plant in order to affirm its life awakening power, likewise the human requires nourishment to quell her own hunger and realize her self-nourishing power. So, so this is a characteristic passage from the manuscripts, the Paris manuscripts, uh, and several things follow from this passage and passages like it. First of all, uh, Marx is an essentialist, and he's an unashamed, he's never ashamed of his essentialism, and he's an essentialist throughout his uh, philosophical development. In his, he's, a, he's an essentialist in his materialist spirit, and he's an essentialist in his um, in his critique of political economy. His essentialist view of the human is never given up despite what uh, the Althusserians would have you believe. So what does this mean? At the very minimum, it means a number of things. It means first that uh, there is such a thing as human nature. It means that human nature for Marx can only be realized in certain forms of interaction with an objective mind independent world. Um, it means that uh, the objective world realizes human nature effectively by uh, fulfilling human needs. And it also means that these needs are fulfilled through the development and growth of human capacities. Throughout the economic and philosophical manuscripts, Marx argues that there is a complex interaction between capacities and needs, so that needs grow which gives rise to new capacities to satisfy these needs, whose satisfaction gives rise to new needs, and so on. Now, this is very important. Marx thinks that the fully developed, self-realizing human has a very developed repertoire of needs and of the means to satisfy them. Marx is not in favor of parochial or limited, uh, small, small is beautiful accounts of human flourishing. He believes that human emancipation requires growth in needs and growth in human capacities, especially in creative and productive powers and capacities. So his models of the human are Milton and Raphael and Spartacus. Human nature, for Marx, essentially picks out humanity, or rather certain features that all able-bodied and able-minded uh, humans share, and that only such humans share. Uh, in the manuscript on estranged labor, for example, Marx writes, uh, the animal is immediately uh, one with its life activity. It does not distinguish itself from it. It is its life activity. Man makes his life activity itself the object of his will and of his consciousness. He has conscious life activity. It is not a determination with which he directly merges. Conscious life, a conscious life activity distinguishes man immediately from life or animal life activity. It is just because of this that he is a species being, or it is only because he is a species being that he is a conscious being, i.e. that his own life is an object for him. Marx is here saying that humans can represent themselves in consciousness, their own uh, beings and doings, uh, as well as their own kind of being and doing. So the idea of species being here means self-conscious, self-knowing humanity. But of course, some animals have self-consciousness uh, or something near enough to self-consciousness. So later in the manuscripts and in his more materialist modes, Marx seems to think that uh, self-consciousness is a necessary but insufficient condition for the human essence. That essence requires, in addition, the ability to use tools for intentional work. The use of, tool, of tools is important for the description of uh, personhood as it requires a consciousness of time, 
duration. Uh, and it also requires an investment of effort in foregoing consumption. You know, to make the tool, you must forego present uh, consumption in the interest of consumption in the future. And that requires uh, consciousness of time, consciousness of duration, consciousness of the self, consciousness of some form of self-interest, and so on. Uh, but again, there is the obvious counterexample of tool using uh, um, non-human animals. So there are uh, biologists have found examples of animals that make and use tools from uh, seagulls to, to chimpanzees. And so even if self-consciousness and uh, tool use are necessary conditions for what makes humans special, uh, they aren't sufficient. Um, so the most promising set of sufficient conditions of the human essence that Marx broaches in the manuscripts is the uniquely human ability for conscious cooperation, including intentional joint production. So Marx thinks it is this aspect of human nature that gives rise to the ability of humans to constantly extend their needs and to develop their capacities in order to satisfy them. So it explains why humans, unlike non-human animals, for example, are capable of such civilizing feats as pyramids and aqueducts and cathedrals and science and medicine and philosophy and optic fibers and Skype or whatnot. Now, let's talk a little bit about this dialectic of capacity and need in Marx. Marx thinks that human self-realization requires the development and satisfaction of a wide array of needs. And in the manuscripts, um, unfortunately, Marx does not explain clearly how needs and capacities grow and develop as complements, or indeed as necessary complements. But he does repeatedly stress that the fully developed individual human presupposes sufficiently developed capacities and powers of humanity as a whole. So here's a characteristic passage which follows a critique that Marx offers of Hegel. So he says, uh, the real active orientation of man to himself as a species being or his manifestation as a real species being, i.e. as a human being, is only possible if he really brings out all his species powers, something which in turn is only possible through the cooperative action of all mankind, only as the result of history, and treats these powers as objects. And this, to begin with, is again only possible in the form of estrangement. Marx is here making at least three claims. The individual, first, the individual human can only realize herself once humanity fully develops her species powers, as powers of self-realization. Secondly, the development of human species powers require the cooperation of all mankind. And thirdly, truly human cooperation is only possible by objectifying the powers that enable it. That is, by humanity coming to, uh, to see its powers as external to or estranged from their subject, that is, humanity. Let's look at each of these claims in turn. In claim A, Marx introduces the idea, an idea rather, that pervades much of his um, later writings, namely that the, develop, the developed individual needs the growth and self-realization of humanity in order to realize herself as an individual. 
So in affirming A, Marx is not uh, affirming some form of moral collectivism. Quite the contrary. Marx was a moral individualist throughout his work. That is, he thought that it is the individual and the individual alone whose uh, quality of life matters. So A merely asserts the idea that individual flourishing needs the development of human powers of self-realization. And in his later materialist writings, Marx will say that one of these powers is human productive power. This is what enables the species power, the species powers in total to grow by giving humans control over nature and by creating free time, that is uh, time away from, produ from production, and by, by making that time widely available. Okay, so that's some comments on A. Some comments on B. So here, this can, B can be construed as at least two claims, so as a conjunction of two claims. First, that the development of the species powers, the powers of humanity, requires a division of labor, a division of productive tasks. Now, Marx hasn't yet developed a theory of um, of the division of labor. And a central notion in his later writings does not yet appear here, which is uh, the idea that there's a social division of labor, which is crippling, exploitative, and subordinating, versus a material, or if you like, um, um, productive division of labor, which has to do with the separation of tasks, tasks which can be uh, performed by different people uh, in different sequences. Uh, but this is a, an important um, distinction that arises in his later writings, which is central to some of the claims about emancipation. Uh, fully emancipated society won't do away with the separation of tasks. It will only do away with the social division of labor. Secondly, in terms of B, this division of labor must be universal, that is, extend to all mankind, as Marx puts it. Anything less uh, than that will mean a parochial, or at least a non-encompassing, extension of cooperation. And again, these are rudiments of a cosmopolitanism that, that pervades all of Marx's writings. It's the cosmopolitanism of the division of labor uh, that knows no borders, no nations, no cultural division. It is about the realization of the productive powers of human beings and their associated human powers. Finally, in C, Marx affirms the well-known Hegelian idea that growth requires separation, sometimes also traveling under the concept of alienation or estrangement. So consider an illustration of that idea that comes from Hegel. So take the example of marriage. Marriage, according to Hegel, may initially involve a form of unity that subordinates the individuality of each, each uh, spouse to their relationship. But this unity may be broken if say uh, one of the so suppose one of the uh, spouses contrives to reassert their individuality hegel thought that the resulting disunity uh, might create momentary tension but it need not destroy the relationship and might even improve it so for example both spouses might come to a new uh, higher unity, which recognizes the individuality 
of each spouse. And this immanent process, uh, Hegelians sometimes call uh, a dialect, dialectical uh, process. Marx affirmed this dialectical idea in his early writings, but gave it a materialist twist. Uh, and um, and I think that materialism is nascent in his uh, early writings. I don't think Marx buys into the romantic uh, anti-capitalism of some of his socialist predecessors. So, for example, he does not think that the pre-industrial ideal of the romantic poets uh, or of William Blake is either accessible or desirable. Industry destroys traditional communities and bonds and customs, but that is a necessary complement to the development of the powers of humanity, what Marx calls in the manuscripts species powers, which is necessary for human flourishing. Anyway, now it follows from C that that uh, human that human species powers might end up developing at the expense of the individual. So already in 1844, it is beginning to dawn upon Marx that communism, the flourishing of the individual in community with others, may require going through the capitalist veil of tears. That is, the free, pay, the free play of individuality, that is communism, might require alienation, at least for some part of humanity's career. So, what is this alienation? What is that alienation that Marx criticizes in his early writings, and especially in the, in the manuscript on estranged labor? One possible answer, according to Marx, first, that labor is external to the worker, i.e. it does not belong to his intrinsic nature that in his work, therefore, he does not affirm himself, but denies himself, does not feel content, but unhappy, does not develop freely his physical and mental energy, but uh, mortifies his body and ruins his mind. The worker, therefore, only feels himself outside his work, and in his work, feels outside himself. And he adds, just as in religion, the spontaneous activity of the human imag imagination, of the human brain and the human heart operates on the individual independently of him, that is, operates as an alien, divine or diabolical activity, so is the worker's activity not his spontaneous activity. It belongs to another. It is the loss of his self. Now, of course, unlike uh, his romantic predecessors, Marx is going to say these diabolical features must be accepted. They're, they may even be welcomed because they're necessary for developing human powers and therefore for human flourishing. But be that as it may, what this passage shows is once again the uh, four Bakian motif of inversion that we encountered in Marx's critique of religion. So there is, uh, you know, Forbach is lurking here in the background. There is, however, a vacillation in this passage and many passages like it between objective and subjective alienation. So notice that Marx says, for example, that it might matter what the worker feels. Does it matter whether the worker feels unhappy or can one be alienated regardless of feeling? So suppose, for example, I, I perform very valuable work as a mathematician. I solve lots of theorems, I'm a brilliant mathematician. Or as a doctor, I save lives, save many lives. Uh, or as a you know, researcher, I discover cures to diseases. But I have very high standards. I have impossibly high standards and I'm never happy with my achievements. So I suffer from subjective alienation. 
Um, but then subjective alienation of itself won't suffice for the kind of phenomenon that Marx is after. And I think this is further vindicated by uh, passages like the following. Marx says that under private property, every person speculates on creating a new need in another, so as to drive him to fresh sacrifice, to place him in a new dependence, and to seduce him into a new mode of enjoyment and therefore economic ruin. Each tries to establish over the other an alien power, so as thereby to find satisfaction of his own selfish need. The increase in the quantity of objects is, is therefore accompanied by an extension of the realm of the alien powers to which man is subjected. And every new product represents a new potentiality of mutual swindling and mutual plundering. Man becomes ever poorer as man. His need for money becomes ever greater if he wants to master the hostile power. Marx, I think, is here saying that under private property, humans become subjected to the product of their labor, if there's a division of labor, of their joint labor, uh, or even more playfully, if you like, they become the property of property. They become a predicate of property, of private property. Under private property, your needs have you. You don't have your needs, says Marx. This extension of the realm of the alien powers, as he puts it, to which humans are subjective, suggests that objective alienation is, at a minimum, a necessary condition for the phenomenon that Marx is after. So feeling, non-feeling, seems secondary. The experience of production and of your product as an alien as an alien power that turns you into its own plaything uh, seems not to require any subjective experience it just happens to you you're a plaything of alien forces marx sometimes writes as if he thinks that both a failure to exercise my species powers my objective alienation, and my sense of non-fulfillment, my subjective alienation, are relevant. So subjective alienation is important for Marx because it's the main motivation for revolution. If I'm alienated in my product but never know it, then I might never do anything about it. But if my objective alienation causes subjective alienation, then, well, maybe I might, uh, might stand up, I might go to the demo, I might storm the Winter Palace. So, in his early writings, Marx found the main agent of revolution not in a rational religion, as in Kant, or in the self-realizing idea, as in Hegel, rather the agent responsible for the appropriation of humanity's essence is the proletariat. Proletariat, basically able-bodied people who work and own nothing but their ability to work. Today would say, you know, working class would say people who own zero net wealth. You know, you might own a house, but uh, you have a mortgage equal or greater equal to or greater than its value so if as the early marx maintains the agent of human emancipation is the proletariat then the alienation of the proletariat had better be more than just an objective uh, state of affairs otherwise there wouldn't be any revolutionary motivation sufficient to overthrow capitalism but these are all speculations. I mean, it's not clear in the early writings uh, whether objective alienation requires subjective or vice versa, how the two are related and so on. But this is unclear. 
But now we might ask, what would replace the system of private property according to the early Marx? His most famous answer comes from this passage, this wonderful and touching passage from the comments on James Mill. Let us suppose that we had carried out production as human beings. Each of us would have in two ways affirmed himself and the other person. In my production, I would have objectified my individuality, its specific character, and therefore enjoyed not only an individual manifestation of my life during the activity, but also when looking at the object, I would have the individual pleasure of knowing my personality to be objective, visible to the senses, and hence a power beyond all doubt. Two, in your enjoyment or use of my project, product, I would have the direct enjoyment both of being conscious of, being, of having satisfied a human need by my work, that is, of having objectified man's essential nature, and of having thus created an object corresponding to the need of another man's essential nature. On it goes on a similar motif. And then uh, Marx concludes our products would be so many mirrors in which we saw reflected our essential natures. This is the apogee of Marx's essentialism. Marx is here claiming that in overthrowing capitalism and replacing it with communism, production becomes humanized because it becomes possible for people to see each other's rational and self-determined activity in the products of their labor. This is how their products become so many mirrors reflecting the rational and self-determined nature of each. The passage also shows that Marx was already, even in his romantic mid-twenties, a moral individualist. So for him, it is the individual human that matters. Communism is the culmination of the freedom of the individual, not of the collective. The collective for Marx matters only insofar as it contributes to the all-around development of human individuality. And this is further vindicated by the Forbachian motif we studied in lecture one. Marx thought that religion, but also the state and capital, are all ways in which humanity comes to control and subjugate the freedom and self-determination of the individual. Uh, so, you know, I extend my hand to grasp what seems like a god, what seems like a cop, what seems like a capitalist. And all I managed to grasp is another bit of myself, um, another bit of my humanity that has lost its way. And the young Hegelians thought that lost humanity can find its way uh, through critical criticism, hence Marx's uh, critique of critical criticism. Uh, and Marx thought that it can only find its way through revolution. It is a practical matter. You have to storm the Winter Palace, otherwise it won't work. Um, and now it pretty much follows that some 20th century totalitarian portrayals of Marx as a collectivist, as a philosopher who put the needs of society above those of the individual, are a complete and total totalitarian uh, fabrication. They also directly contradict Marx's early writings, and in the following lectures we will see that they contradict all of Marx's writings, which are explicitly focused on the emancipation of the individual. In preparing for the next lecture, lecture three, which is on historical materialism, I would suggest that you read the Communist Manifesto and the preface to a contribution to the critique of political economy. Um, and if you get, can get your hands on the secondary literature, I think you might also benefit from reading uh, Jerry Cohen's essay on forces and relations of production. That's the first essay in his uh, History, Labor and Freedom book, but it's been very widely reprinted. I will leave you with uh, the trailer to uh, a nice movie entitled The 
young Karl Marx, uh, which I don't know, may be available online. If you do watch it, make sure you watch the, I think it's the international version of it, where you get the full cosmopolitan Marx, Marx speaking three languages in four different countries in two, three years. Enjoy.